And I will welcome Philip to keep his um, talk on, uh, I think he'll continue on angular momentum despite the, the discussion we had yesterday. I think he chose to crop some slides and do the angular momentum because all of you were very keen about it, I guess. Um, Okay, so let's see. Um, so I was thinking what I should do, given that, that it wasn't clear what I should talk about today. So, so what I decided to do was to, what I've decided to do is, is to talk about all these things, but I've cut out quite a few slides, so you're not going to hear everything about all the topics. And we'll see how it goes. If, if I talk very fast, maybe you'll have some chance to hear some other stuff. So that's, that's the plan. So let's, uh, let's get started here. Um, Go back to this one, and now what I'm going to talk about is um, you, you've, you've heard about these strange, the mystery of the dips, uh, so where these come from. We heard about this idea of topological phase matching, and I've talked a bit, little bit about, uh, I think, did I talk about helical block waves, or maybe I mentioned them yesterday? Um, but, but the idea with this, this topic is to take these results with these dips which create these, these ring-shaped modes in the cladding that carry OAM. And they're very lossy because they refract away from the structure and they get lost, you lose the light. But to make a structure where you could create um, states like this, you could create modes that carry OAM, ring-shaped modes, which don't have any loss. And the obvious way to do that is to make a fiber with, say, n cores, maybe three or six or some number of cores placed, placed in a ring like this. Um, so I, I call this a propeller PCF sometimes. Uh, you, you'll see why in a minute. I mean, it looks a bit, you could think that's a bit like a propeller. Um, it's got six cores. Uh, it's a photonic crystal fiber. These are the hollow channels as before. Um, these are solid glass cores. And they're placed in a ring. There isn't any core in the middle. And uh, if, you, if you launch a mode into those cores, they're coupled to each other, so they're not completely independent. They, they can actually have a conversation. So light in this core can have a conversation with light in this core. It's called coupling. Um, and if the mode goes along, we can see just as before that you get a very strong twisting of the mode on the right, which, um, which will have some, some effect on the light and create orbital angular momentum. And once again, the twist rate is alpha 2 pi over the helical pitch. I can see my batteries are dying here. Maybe I can use it. Is there another one here? Yeah, it's this one here, yeah? put mine away. The batteries last about five minutes on these things. They're terrible. Okay. But this, this should work as well, shouldn't it? Ah, I'm not dead no, just say okay, just to continue to, oh, okay. Okay. to skip it. Uh, yeah, I just, I think you can ignore that. I don't need to I'll turn this on. This one doesn't work. See the batteries. Oh, it doesn't have any batteries. <laughs> So we're going to be talking about this six ring structure and analyzing it a little bit and I hope you'll uh... ah very good thank you I hope this will will help and help you understand even better the how, how these how these fibers fibers work so let's just think about this um, we're, we're, we want to analyze a structure with six cores that are coupled to each other. Well, let's just let's do a thought experiment. Let's, let's think, OK, it's a periodic structure of some sort. It's got six cores. Uh, how do I analyze a, a six structure? How do I work out the block waves of a six, uh, six uh, core structure or periodic structure? Well, I start in this very simplest case. I start with a whole lot of parallel single mode waveguides that are close enough together. The pitch is lambda. 
close enough together they can talk to each other. In other words, they can couple between, between. And then, then if you set up, if you, if you imagine nearest neighbor couplings, and you apply Bloch's theorem, Bloch's theorem basically says that the um, the uh, field here, well, I mean that that the the um, if you go from one period to the next, there'll be a Bloch wave vector that tells you how much the phase changes when you go from this period to this period, and then there'll be a periodic function somehow rather in. The, it, it, well, it'll be periodic anyway because of the way the structure is, but, but you can, by applying Bloch's theorem to this, we end up with a dispersion relation which describes the, which relates the propagation constant in the, along the axis of the structure in the z, z direction, we might call it here, to the transverse wave vector. So this is a two-dimensional structure. There's no third dimension in this case. Um, and what we get is that the wave vector is equal to beta zero, which would be the wave vector of one of these individual guides. So if I just take one of these guides away and measure its propagation constant in isolation, it's going to be beta zero. But then when they couple to each other, you get an additional term here as a result of the, of the coupling. And this is twice times the coupling constant. This is just the strength of the coupling between these two guides uh, times the cosine of the block wave vector times the pitch. And this describes the dispersion surface. And this allows us to relate the, the, the beta value in the axial direction to the, the wave vector in the transverse direction in, in this structure. The normalized to the pitch just for convenience. So you get this, this characteristic sinusoidal surface. If you've done solid state physics, you will definitely have derived this at the, the beginning of band structure lectures. Um, it's, it's a classic kind of nearest neighbor couple tight binding approximation, it's called. Um, and if we look at this diagram, this, this is quite revealing. It's, it's, a, it's a sinusoidal function. It goes on and on forever with, with, with KB. So if we have, um, for example, we pick a point on this green, this green dispersion surface, as we call it. Um, it's at fixed optical frequency uh, for, for this discussion because we're interested in two-dimensional propagation, fixed optical frequency. If we pick a point at the top, then... Um, well, one thing, one thing about these, these surfaces is that the group velocity is, is um, points, always points normal to the surface. Um, it's, it's the gradient, well, the way we write that sometimes is it's the gradient, the gradient of omega of KB um, in, in, in K space. I shouldn't have done that. So that's, that's the group velocity. You can also write it in tensor form if you want. You can also write it as just d omega by dkb if you're comfortable with taking derivatives with a vector in the bottom. <laughs> but they mean the same thing. So the group velocity is given by the gradient of the dispersion relation. The omega is a function of wave vector in, in reciprocal space. And this, in fact, is in reciprocal space. This is wave vector space. This is momentum space. It's not real space. But we can look in at these curves in reciprocal space and with that expression. Uh, we, we take a point on the surface, we look at the, the, the direction of the normal, and, uh, and then we imagine increasing the frequency of the light a little bit. The surfaces will move, will, move, will, will move upwards in this case, so that's the direction of the group velocity. So points at the top of the surface have no group velocity component in, in, the, in, the, in the horizontal direction. It, the, the wave travels entirely, group velocity travels entirely along, along the, the waveguides. Something else you'll find is, I talked about, I talked about harmonics yesterday. But there's going to be some kind of periodic uh, function, which is part of the block wave. The periodic function in this case has to have the same periodicity as the waveguide structure itself. Uh, but we can work out the harmonics. And if we work out the harmonics of this, we will see that there's, there's one at, at KB0. And then just another real one zone across. We get another one at minus, uh, at minus uh, 2 pi, and one at plus 2 pi for KB lambda. And you get lots of, lots of uh, different different harmonics of the wave. And um, OK, so uh, if we look, if we just let these harmonics interfere and create the field pattern, what you find is you get a field pattern which stays positive everywhere. So the field is in phase everywhere in the structure. It's periodic and it's in phase. Um, and, uh, and we end up with a, under these circumstances, the, the light is, is, is sort of maximally kind of concentrated in the high refractive index regions. And we get a, we get a high refractive index here. And it's, it's, two, it's, it's two kappa higher. So this whole thing is four kappa 
So you go from B to zero, it's two kappa higher, it gets you, gets you to the propagation constant of this mode. That's at the top of the dispersion surface. What about the bottom of the dispersion surface, this point? Once again, the group velocity is pointing along the uh, z direction, yeah? But this time, we were interfering a wave going here and a wave going here. We interfere these two things in an interference pattern, and it turns out that the phase of the electric fields changes sign as we cross. So it now goes to, to zero in between. And this is like the odd mode of, of you have two waveguides coupled to each other. You have an even mode and you have an odd mode where the field goes to zero in the middle. And in this case, um, we get a lower refractive index because the field goes to zero in between. And uh, it's lower by two kappa. So, and once again, the group velocity points along. Now, why does the group velocity point in that direction? Well, we have two harmonics, this harmonic and this harmonic. One's going that way, the other's going this way, and they have a kind of tug of war. This one wants to go this way, this one wants to go this way, but they're kind of coupled together by the periodic structure. So the overall power flow is in this direction. It's as simple as that. And it gets more interesting now if we go somewhere in between, so we take a point like this. Um, now we can see the group velocity is no longer pointing along the waveguides, but it's actually pointing at some angle. There's some kind of, there's a flow of power across the, across the periodic structure. Um, and in this case, if we do the same, have the same sort of picture of, of these, this, this wave kind of um, uh, competing with this wave, uh, in this particular case, this one is going to have a, have a higher amplitude and this a lower amplitude, so that when, we, when we add them up, uh, these, two, these two harmonics, this one's going to pull more strongly, so there'll be a flow of power in this, as well as going along, there'll be a flow of power across the, across the waveguides. And in this case, if we try and plot the fields, we'll see we get a nice periodic pattern, just as before, but it doesn't, the fields don't go to zero. And if you look at this, it's actually a complex field. We can't, can't really, I'd have to plot the rail and imaginary parts separately of the field in this case. Uh, whereas here, I don't need to do that, or, or, nor here. But in this case, it's a complex field. And as well as this period, this standing wave pattern, you probably know that a standing wave doesn't carry any power. It, it stores power, but it doesn't carry, it doesn't carry power anywhere. But the, this little, this, this, the fact that it doesn't go to zero means that underneath there's a flow of power in some direction. And in order to get power to flow across the structure, the field is not allowed to go to zero in, the, in between. If the field goes to zero, there's no power flow. There's no possibility of power flow if the field goes to zero. But in this case, there is power flow. OK, so that's an, a little introduction to block waves. And I want to come back now to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the six core system. So we've got, a six core, we've got six cores in a ring. And I want somehow to relate this analysis to that six core structure. Is there some nice way to do that? Well, it turns out there is. Um, all I have to do is take six periods, six of these waveguides. And I've cut one of them in half. But that, that one's supposed to be half of or a, a fraction of that one. So when you add this one to this one, you get a full period. If I then I take that, I write that on a piece of paper, and I roll it around to make a cylinder out of it, Yeah, I end up with this structure. So this, this means that I, I can now take the dispersion relation I, I derived for, there it is a, again over there, and I can now apply it to this, this ring structure. Now light, light is not the most intelligent thing in the world. It satisfies Maxwell's equations, which is probably quite intelligent because they're quite complicated. But it, it's, it's pretty dumb in some ways. I mean, it's, it, the, it, the light is going around this ring, the block wave is going around this ring. Block waves go, travel through a periodic structure forever with, without being scattered. The light doesn't know that the structure isn't infinite. It just keeps going. It comes back to this core again after a re revolution. It doesn't know it's a new core. It doesn't care. It just keeps traveling. So it's, it's, it's like, a, like a version of this, except it's infinite, because the light goes round and round and round and round forever. Um, OK, so now we can, we can think about uh, group velocity and so on. You've heard about this already. So if I take a point like this, uh, this, this particular block wave, it has a group velocity pointing in, in, so it's going to be spinning around the, the ring in this direction. Uh, I could have another one like this. And the, you can see I've chosen certain points. These points you have to choose. The, the, the only certain values of, of, of this azimuthal wave vector are allowed because of the need for a resonance as we go around. The light can only go round and round and round 
if it comes back, when it comes back to the same place, it's in phase with the phase it had before. I just discussed that yesterday. So this, this, is, the, this is the high orbital angular momentum forms. Um, in this case, we can get several different values of, 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 the, um, of, of k, the azimuthal wave vector kinds of pitch, in other words, the orbital angular momentum. Um, and I can actually assign values to this. So for, for the blue dots, this particular harmonic of the block wave, it has, I've drawn in three harmonics here. The, the, this harmonic has OAM order one, which means that when I go around once, the optical phase advances by two pi. Plus two one, it will advance by uh, four pi. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, we have harmonics. Plus one brings with it minus five. Plus one brings it with it uh, plus seven. And uh, so for, for these harmonics, they would have 14. That would be 14 times pi for one revolution. This would be uh, 10 minus 10 pi uh, for going in the backward direction. So it's quite a complicated system. And it's this is just the straight system. I haven't started twisting it yet. When I get to twist it, it's, it's, it's sort of fun. Um, I can also find the other modes, the modes of step group velocity go in the opposite direction. These would be these points in exactly the same way. I can, I can work out the OAM values. Um, and I have, for example, plus one going in this direction. I can find a minus one that goes in the opposite direction that has exactly the same propagation constant. These red dots have exactly the same value of beta on both diagrams, which means that I can have multiple values of orbital angular momentum in a block wave. So they're the red dots. These are the multiple values whatever they are, 8, 2, and minus 4 in that case. Uh, but there's a single axial wave vector. This is a real eigenmode in the normal sense. It, it travels through the material without change. Nothing changes. It's completely stationary in terms of its structure as it, as it progresses along the six-chord structure. This is the straight system. So how do we treat a twisted system? Well, it's actually very simple. All we have to do is tilt. All we have to do is tilt this structure by a small angle, which corresponds to the twist rate. And then, if you look at the look at the dispersion diagrams, they also twist because they're they're completely locked. They're locked to this parallel waveguide system. So all we have to do is is rotate the the dispersion surface by the same amount as the physical structure in real space. And once again, the block waves, you can see what happens. And this is kind of what I was saying yesterday, but a better illustration of it. I take the blue dots. I get a blue dot here, which corresponds to OAM order plus 1. But then I take, say, this harmonic with the order plus 7. It has a slightly different propagation constant compared to this one. And this one, similarly, at minus 5, has a slightly higher propagation constant. And it's the difference between this propagation constant and this one Whenever you superimpose those two waves, you have an interference pattern. And because the propagation constants are different, that interference pattern will rotate as you, as you go along the fiber, which is what you need in this case. So here we have non-degenerate modes in this case. Now, what I mean by non-degenerate is if I take the plus one order here, the blue one, and I compare it with the, the minus one order, which is the blue one here, they have completely different propagation constants. You can see that are different points on the surface. So what we've done is to create, by twisting the fiber, we've created a new form, a novel form of birefringence, which is birefringence in the orbital angular momentum. You're familiar with birefringence, linear birefringence, of course. And you're probably also familiar with, well, I talked about optical activity a little bit. You're familiar with circular birefringence, where left and right circularly polarized light has different propagation constants. Well, here we have a, a system in the twisted fiber where I think probably for the first time, we, we actually are able to, in, certainly in a fiber, we're able to, to distinguish, to prevent scattering from, from, say, the plus one order here to the minus one order. So if there's a little bit of scattering or something in the fiber, the light will, will not actually scatter into this mode. You, 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 you're going to find it difficult to reflect light into the backward direction once it's going in the forward direction. So it's behaving like uh, what people call topological insulators. That's one of those buzzwords that everyone loves to talk about, which has come from solid state physics. And this is kind of like a photonic analogy of that. OK, so just to show you how this, this works, um, 
I'm not, obviously not going to derive this, this, this equation, um, but it's fairly straightforward. You have to be a little bit careful with all the approximations, but it's fairly straightforward to derive a closed form uh, expression for the refractive index of the, <coughs> let's see, this is the mth harmonic. Uh, this is the refractive index in the z direction along the axis of the mth harmonic of one of these block weights. This is the OAM order. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the coupling constant. So, so th this expression, you can use this to plot something like this. Uh, so in this case, I'm plotting with n equals 3. So it's a three core ring, something like this with three cores. <clears throat> and if I plot the refractive indices, this is the refractive index of the optical block mode, minus 1.45, just to make it simple. So 0 is when the index equals 1.45. Um, then we see that as we increase the twist rate, we get a splitting in the, between the plus one and the minus one, creating orbital angular momentum by refringence. And um, the difference in refractive index between the plus and the minus is proportional to the twist rate. It's actually given by alpha times the wavelength over pi times the OAM order. You can see that in this expression here, actually. Um, if I change the sign of L, I get one of them is alpha lambda over 2 pi times L. And if I have minus L, I, add, I get another one of those. So I lose the 2. I get alpha lambda over pi, which is what you get here. OK. So just to show you some results, this does actually work. We made this fiber. There's a picture of it. Uh, we, we spun it during fiber drawing. So the twist period in this case was about 2 millimeters. Um, that's quite a dangerous experiment. I mean, it's a combination of high-speed twisting of a piece of glass that might shatter. It's a furnace that's running at 2,000 degrees Celsius. And you have to be there close to it to make sure things don't go wrong. Mm -hmm. So we have to build a very strong kind of uh, transparent cage around the furnace and, and around the preform because we're spinning it so fast. I mean, so far, we, I don't think it ever shattered, actually, but, but there's a good chance it might at some point. So you have to be very careful. Don't do this at home. <laughs> <laughs> OK, anyway, so we made, we made long lengths. And uh, we did some experiments with 50 meters of this fiber. And by careful, carefully adjusting the launch, we can excite these individual OAM orders. And so when the light goes along the 50 meter length, you take the light coming out the other end. And, uh, and then you, you have to work out, does it have OAM or not? And the way to do this, uh, there are lots of ways to do it, actually. But the way we've used here uh, is to take a Gaussian, just take a laser beam approximately Gaussian, and make it divergent. So it needs to be fairly divergent. And then we interfere that diverging beam with the light coming out of the fiber. And by doing this, it's fairly straightforward to show that you, get the, you, you can get spiral patterns that represent the, um, the, um, that represent the, the orbital angular momentum, or the topological phase, as, you, as, as we sometimes call it. Um, uh, so the minus 2, for example, you, gives you two spirals. You can see the two spirals in, in the middle. L equals minus 1 has one spiral. L equals plus 1 has one spiral going the other way. L equals plus 2 has two spirals going the other way. So it does work. These are preserved over long lengths of fiber coiled up and bent and, and so on. It really does preserve the OAM order, no, not just the order, but also its, 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 its sign. OK, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about the end core rings, I'm not going to talk about this, but I would like to talk about something really curious that I still find fascinating, is that uh, it's low loss guidance in a coreless PCF. And I do mean coreless. So just jumping back to the 1990s, I was giving lots of talks about these fibers. And one of the things I, I like to do, this is a slide from back then. Um, the very first fiber we made back in November 95, actually, looked like this. And this was just a test. You know, you see, does the technology work? So you make a stack and you draw it. And at that stage, we weren't sure we'd ever make something that guided light. So we just wanted to see if we could make something. So we made this structure, which doesn't have any core. Uh, so it looks a bit like this. And from what I used to say in this, this talk was that the first photonic crystal fiber was useless because it needed defects. A defect, you can have a defective defect and an effective defect. You understand that? 
A defective defect is something you really don't bloody want, you know, but an effect, effective defect is useful. And effective defects are things like this, where we'd make two large holes, leave out a, leave out a hollow channel, make a birefringent core. We could make a hollow core, maybe. We could make two cores next to each other. These are useful defects. They're defects because they're a, a, a discontinuity in the periodicity of the structure. So I thought this was, this was it, and then I'd go on to explain all the wonderful things you could do with, with these, these defects. But nevertheless, sometimes what you say is, is not necessarily going to stay true forever. Um, if you take a coreless PCF, one of those fibers I showed you, and you twist it helically, it guides light. <laughs> There's no core. You know, you look at this, it's perfectly periodic. If you, take, if you cut through this fiber at one particular place, you, you'll see the periodicity is preserved. There's nothing in the transverse cross section. You could measure the refractive index there if you want. If you could do, you could do that, I guess, with an obsometry, maybe, using one of these machines. You, you could measure the refractive index. Uh, you wouldn't see any variation in refractive index. It's, it's a perfectly periodic structure. There is no waveguide. The light cannot be guided, you would say. Nevertheless, it, it is guided because the fiber is twisted somehow. You know, so, uh, and just to show the, just to show you, I'm going to show, these, show you these again later once I've discussed it a bit. But here's the experiment at different twist rates, 1.26, 2.86, and, and pi. So we're increasing the twist rate. And as we kind of increase the twist rate, it's a little bit when you're, you're wringing the water out of a towel. You know, you, the tighter you twist it, the more the water comes out. But in this case, the tighter you twist it, the more confined the light is. It's not quite the same thing. But, um, and the simulations agree remarkably well with the experiments, as you can see. OK, so what on earth is going on here? Well, I'm going to come back to my, uh, my picture of this topological distortion in space. We're creating curved space, or helically curved space in this case. The untwisted coreless PCF, this is the refractive index distribution. There is no core. I, I showed you this before, but there was a core. There wasn't a hole in the middle, OK? In this case, there isn't any core. And if you, if you run finite element modeling on this, you can work out the at a fixed optical frequency, you can work out the values of uh, refract axial refractive index where the light is able to propagate in, in the plane, freely propagate in, in, in the plane. If you go beyond that point, it's not allowed to propagate. And below that point, you, you, you may get a photonic band gap, for example, that prevents the light propagating. So that's the passband for the fundamental space filling modes in the untwisted case. And just as before, if I make the fiber twisted, that whole structure becomes quadratically distorted. So the, the, the average refractive index at every point has been lifted up in proportion to the radius squared. You get a topological increase in path length with radius. It's not actually a change in refractive index. It's a change in the optical path length, which translates into, effectively, a change in the, the refractive index, the light, uh, the change in how, how long the light takes to go from A to B. Uh, both in group velocity terms and in phase velocity terms. So it's, it's, it's purely, a, purely a topological thing. It's something to do with geometry. OK, so what does this buy us? Well, I'm going to draw, so I'm going to take just this picture and, and leave out, leave out this, this, this structure and just show you the, the passband. So we have a passband like this, axial refractive index upwards. And this is now radius, so uh, just as before. Um, so where to start? So let, let's, let's think about a propagation constant, say this, this yellow line here. If I put some light in at some, some radius, if I imagine there's some light sitting here, um, then it's going to refract outwards because, because the, the, the passband is, is, is going upwards. The light is propagating in here. If I have light propagating, uh, in, in, it can propagate out and then at some and just con it continues going out. It, it, doesn't, it, it refracts outwards because the refractive index is going upwards. There's nothing there to reflect the light back in. It just continuously refracts outwards. So we have an anti-guiding process up there. Um, and in fact, if you look at this, this, this line, you'll find the field lobes are in phase. And by field lobes, I mean these little blobs of light you see here. These little blobs of light are all in, if you're at the top of the band, they're all in phase. 
That's a little bit like the block wave I talked about a moment ago. Okay, so this is anti-guiding. You definitely don't get any guidance there. And in fact, this is what happens with those dips in the spectrum. These are the kind of modes I'm exciting. They're, they're going to be, they're going to exist up here somewhere where, they, where they're not, not trapped. Okay, so let's see. Um, if we go down to the bottom of the passband, on the other hand, then we can have a situation where the light is, um, is, is able to propagate uh, um, in, in the center of the fiber, but then in the passband, so at this point it's propagating. Okay, so it's, it's propagating, it's able to propagate here, it's in the passband. And then as it moves away from the radius, it hits a point where it, it encounters a photonic band gap at some radius. And at that point, it gets reflected back. So, so, so the light then is going to be, if you look at the picture, it's going to be going to and fro, stopping, coming back, stopping, coming back, stopping, coming back. And because it's a two-dimensional system, you can have orbitals. So the light could be going around uh, the axis like, uh, like the moon goes around the Earth or the Earth goes around the sun. OK, so, so what we're doing here, in fact, I use this word deliberately because this really has very, very strong uh, connections to the general theory of relativity. Um, we, you know, because space is curved, so you put some mass in space, it gets curved, and light, light can go around corners and do weird things. Um, here, we're, we're creating a periodic space, a space that's periodic, and uh, it's, we're curving it. We're not changing its refractive index or anything like that. We're merely curving the space. And by doing that, we're able to create a kind of gravitational wormhole for light. You may think that's funny, but actually the equations I'm, I use to describe this are just the same. I don't, I don't think I'm going to show you the equations. But I just wanted to show you a little bit about how you can analyze this. So if we, if we think about, about this coreless PCF, it turns out that the, the, the modes that exist in this passband, uh, the, you can view them as, as consisting of, of, of uh, carbon rings, of blobs of light that form little carbon rings. So there's a blob, there's a blob, there's a blob, there's a blob. So it's a little ring of six, six blobs of light that are guided. And, and then you tile that over the entire periodic structure. And again, we assume nearest neighbor coupling. So we assume this blob couples to this one, and to this one, to this one. So, and you apply Bloch's theorem to this two-dimensional system. And of course, many of you will know this is just exactly what graphene is. This is an optical version of graphene. And uh, if you derive this, uh, we, we, if you, you run the, it's very simple to calculate, actually. You can you immediately find the Dirac points in the middle of the passband. In the middle of this passband, you'll find there's a Dirac point. Uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about today, but, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, you can do that, but, uh, but you also need to run finite element modeling to get the correct shape. So that simple analysis doesn't give you, really give you the precise shape of the curves, but, but here they are. So um, what you see here are the dispersion surfaces for two different directions in the transverse plane. So one of the directions, you get these white curves. And there's a sort of stop band between this band and this band. And the upper band looks like this. If I go in one of the other directions, I, I find the bands are continuous right across. And there's a Dirac point here and here. That's just, just for curiosity. So this whole, um, from here, from this refractive index to this refractive index is the, is the pass band. So we have a low value refractive index. It's the bottom of the pass band. And at the top, we have the space filling mode index, which is the one up here. And what I'm going to assume is that I'm sitting here, I'm sitting on the axis. So these red dots, so this now is real space. This is in real space, this is reciprocal space. If I'm sitting here, the light is going to be, and this is a ray path of the light, the light's going to be traveling in this direction here. Okay, the group velocity is going to be going at some angle, so you can see the group velocity going in this direction. We've learned that already. It's normal to these curves. Group velocity goes in this direction here. So if it's going in that direction, it's going to be traveling to a different value of radius. It's going to be moving outwards from, from the axis to some other value of radius. And when it goes to some other value of radius, the, there's going to be a topological change in the, in the, in the refractive index because of, because of the twisting. And what happens is the dispersion surface shifts upwards in this case. Yeah, because I'm, I'm moving outwards. If I move outwards, the whole dispersion surface moves upwards because of that quadratic dependence on radius. So I go from here 
it jumps up to some particular point. So now I, I, I maintain the same value of refractive index in all cases. That, that, that's a constant. That doesn't change. I mean, that's something you can't change in the system because, because of the way it works. OK, so we keep that constant. And then we find that we've now moved in. The red dots have now moved into these points. And we've moved, we've slightly changed the group velocity direction. So it's kind of become slightly more parallel to the axis. I jump up to here. I've now hit this point where the group velocity is now pointing along the axis. OK? And if I try to go beyond that point, the, the dispersion surface is, is above this dotted line. So I'm now inside a photonic band gap. So the light is unable to, to propagate. So what happens is the light, well, it, it just simply doesn't go anywhere. It actually, it actually gets reflected. It gets reflected and, 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 and comes, it comes back. So, so it'll come back. When it comes back, then the surfaces will go down again. You get to here, and down again. I get to this point, uh, and so on. So it, it just oscillates to and fro inside. It's trapped. And uh, just, to, just to prove that this, uh, I'm, I'm not going to derive these things, but, but if, you, if you have a look at general relativity and the equations describing it, and in particular, in, in optics, we call this Hamiltonian optics, something I published a long time ago, actually, this equation. This is an equation that tells you how the, uh, the this x thing is, is what's known as a four vector. It contains the three spatial coordinates and, and time, or c times time, usually minus c times time. And, and the, 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 K, uh, the K in here is, is a four vector in reciprocal space. So it has three components of wave vector and, minus, and plus omega over C. So these are two four vectors. One of them is in reciprocal space. The other is in real space. And uh, when you have curved space, these two things are coupled to each other. So if you move in real space, you also move in reciprocal space, They're coupled to each other in an absolutely magical way. Um, uh, you can take the equations describing that and express them in a form that looks like Newtonian, Newtonian mechanics. So this looks like acceleration. This sigma is just an independent parameter. It's like, you know, like the way a computer works. You've got a clock that goes tick, 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 tick. And everything in the computer is sitting there waiting for the next tick, and then it does something. Tick, tick, you know. So this is how a computer works. That's what the sigma is. This is just the, the tick. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's just giving you a way of stepping through space and time in, in steps and, and seeing how things change. Afterwards, we can relate sigma to time or to space or whatever we want. Then we have uh, uh, the, this interesting thing here, which, which is the double gradient, so del squared, if you like, in reciprocal space of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is, is by the way, the dispersion relation of the light. It, it tells you how the wave vectors are related to the, uh, the frequency of the light and also to the spatial position. This, this is the radius in this case. The dispersion relation changes as you move out in radius. So this Hamiltonian will typically have wave vectors in it and also spatial coordinates. So it's a mixture of, it's a mixture of reciprocal space and, and real space. And this turns out to be the reciprocal effective mass tensor. And then if you want to create force, the equivalent of a force, then you need to have, um, you need to have there needs to be some gradient in real space of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has to change. The dispersion relation has to change from place to place. That's exactly what happens in this helical structure because it's, it's, it's got this quadratic dependence on, on the radius. So we do have a gradient of the Hamiltonian in real space. And that's what gives you the force. That, that, is, that is what force is. If there's some kind of gradient in real space of that Hamiltonian, you get force. And, and, you know, so OK, so, the, so that, that's what that is. This is the Hamiltonian. It contains the quadratic dependence on radius and, and everything. And you plug in this into here. And after, actually, it's, it's, it, you know, it takes a little while to get used to it. But you, you can end up with this nice equation here for, say, propagating in the x direction. We have the acceleration in the x direction is equal to minus a bunch of constants times x. So it's just the equation of harmonic motion, provided, provided A is positive. The curvature, provided the curvature is is positive. Um, if I go back to, I think to this one, the curvature here is opposite to the one down here in, in terms of, um, of, the, of the way the thing works. So we get an anti-guide here. The A is going to be uh, positive. Uh, going to be negative here and positive down here, and that's what allows us to to, to trap light. 
So, so if it provided A is positive, we have harmonic motion and we get that, get that periodic kind of uh, behavior of the rays. So that explains what you're seeing here. Okay. What do you feel about that? Is it too complicated? Yeah? Yeah, do you want me to explain that? I'm not sure I can at the moment. <laughs> Maybe we can discuss it afterwards. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess it's just in the Hamiltonian is the definition of this. <laughs> okay, so that's. Um, does anyone else want to ask any questions about that? Yeah, yeah go ahead. You're not a student. Yeah. You, you, you're a student, okay. Um, you had said that, that one way of thinking about that is that the, the light, as you move out in radius, propagates more slowly, I thought. You said. Yeah, that yeah, right? yeah. So that, that struck me as a little counterintuitive because usually in a, in a guided wave fiber, you know, you have the, the slower, the higher index in the center, yeah. and the light on the yeah. outside yeah. is traveling more yeah. rapidly. So yeah. it's, I guess, Probably I'm wrong. It's an anti-guide. No, you're quite right to say that. Okay. That's exactly what I was kind of trying to get at, actually. I, I didn't, didn't do such a good job. I'll just go back to probably this. I don't know, that maybe something. But this one. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, let me try and try and suppose, suppose I, maybe I, suppose I was sitting. I have a feeling my, one of my pictures wasn't right. But if I'm inside the passband, so I suppose I'm sitting here. The light's propagating, and this is on the axis. This, this is on the axis, and uh, if I move outwards, the light continues to propagate. You know, okay. I mean, okay, you might you might eventually hit hit here and get a photonic band gap, but it's a bit unlikely. But if you're close to the top, the light will just continuously refract outwards because of the way this works. Yeah. But if I'm at the bottom. And I, I move outwards, then I, I, I very very soon hit the photonic band gap, and the light gets reflected in. So it, so it becomes confined. It, it, it becomes confined in. It really shouldn't be confined. It's, it's like it's sitting on the top of a hill and should really roll down. But at some point, a photonic band gap comes in and stops it, yeah. <laughs> reflects it back up again somehow. Yeah. Does that help a bit? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I just wonder if, because uh, that, that, that slide. Oh, sorry, you want me to go back? Yeah, okay. the slide. So when we twist the fiber, colorless fiber, the pass length is different, right, from the uh, uh, inner core and the outer core. Yeah. Happen if we fix the pass length by maybe varying the, the, the core? And is it uh, the Colors PCF can guide the light in the if you fix the path length. Yeah, I mean you could you could create you, you could create a structure where, where the periodicity wasn't where there's a radial variation in periodicity. So that so that when initially it wouldn't maybe guide light, but then no it would initially it would guide light, but no you then you can stop guiding light by twisting it. And, you, know, you could do that as well. You could kill off guidance by, by twisting if you wanted to. And, and in fact, that's one of, the, one of the things I find really interesting. I didn't mention applications because I'm more, more interested in the physics, I have to say, um, although applications may emerge from this. But one of the nice things, if I just go to that final picture, actually, this will take a little while. Come on, come on. I don't know why these graphs take so long to form. But uh, you can see that just by changing the twist rate, I, I could have a length of fiber, and I could have different twist rates at different positions, and locally I could... I could reduce the twist rate, and then the mode will, will become bigger. And if I reduce it enough, the mode could then encounter the edge, edge of the fiber. And I could use that for sensing something, maybe. Or I could then interact with the field, do something to it, and then twist it up again, and it gets, it gets trapped back in. So you could create kind of local sensors or something using that. Maybe other applications, too. I don't know. Okay. Do I understand the units right? That's really. In one millimeter, it's twisting 180 yeah, degrees. Yeah, 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 so absolutely. Really yeah, pulling that. It's, it's, it's extremely, it's, it's quite frightening to watch it in the fiber drawing. 
But if we do it in that in that put in the in the post processing thing with just a motor and holding one end, do a short length, we can make much smaller pitches. We I think we've made three hundred micron pitch in that case. Yeah, I mean, you have to get the conditions right, but it does work. I mean, it's uh, yeah. Is the the loss? Uh, very good question. Uh, can I give you a value for the loss? Um, it's it's. I would guess it's it's somewhere around, although I can't remember the figures off the top of my head. I, it's some, somewhere around a fraction of a dB per meter. You know, it's it's uh, that sort of order. We we haven't really thought about how low we can get the loss, but it's low enough so we can we can do we can do measurements like this over 50 meters of fiber and, and get some light out the other end. I mean, the applications for this may be uh, in I don't know what they are actually. I don't really care. I just think it's really. <laughs> I think it's really cool. You you can think of some applications and let me know. Yeah, maybe we'll make a lot of money. That's what it's all about, isn't it? No, it's not. Not for me anyway. So shall I continue? Look, I just have one one note. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess the way you calculate this this feud pattern is by adjusting the fiber, right? By applying the helical coordinate system and and solving for the finite element. How do we method. calculate it? Yeah. Um, we calculate it by, and I haven't talked about that at all, but it's in, in the papers if you look, look it up. You, you can take Maxwell's equations uh, in, Cartu in Cartesian coordinate system and transform them into the helicoidal coordinate system. This is this unpleasant non-orthogonal coordinate system. It may be an unpleasant, and co unpleasant coordinate system, but, but when you do this, something magic happens to the, to the epsilon and the mu. They develop off-diagonal elements, and Maxwell's equations fall into a form where where nothing changes along the length except except the propagation. So mm -hmm. so everything everything is collapsed into the transverse plane. So it makes it much easier to solve. And then you can solve the equations using standard finite element techniques, and then transform back into the into the laboratory frame to, to get the actual values. Yeah, I'm wondering how would the density of states plot that we usually work for the, the hollow core ah, PCFs look yeah. like in, the, in this kind of system? Did you guys work that out yet? Or? No, we haven't thought of that. I mean, one of the difficulties of this is it's not truly. Really I said, I mean, I'm going to say something I shouldn't say. Maybe it's not truly periodic in a sense, yeah, yeah. because the, the, although, it, although in, in the transverse plane all the refractive indices look look periodic, in, uh, as you move further right, you are you are changing things. You're, you're changing the path lengths. Yeah. It, it's it's, it's taken a long time cell, to guess, understand right? this for me. It really has taken a long time to understand this. Um, just just the fact that curving the space can can do this, these magical things. You don't need to change the index or something. And you can't curve space normally. This, this cylindrical curves thing is a perfect way of doing it. If you try to do it in some other geometry, it doesn't work. But this, this just allows you to play. You know. it's, it's, it's. OK. So let's see. Right, I was going to talk not, not too much about this. I, I've cut out most of this talk. but I. Left a little bit in, um, because I wanted. To, well, I think you, it, it would be nice for you to hear something about about this work at least. And this has to do with. Well done. Yeah, this has to do with nonlinear optics in hollow core photonic crystal fiber. So it's this kind of fiber, and it's filled with with gas. Uh, I am going to talk about pressure control and dispersion, and I'm going to jump down to these two topics. I'm going to leave out all this stuff. Again, if there's some time at the end, I can, I can certainly talk about these if someone wants me to. But so, okay, so pressure control of dispersion. I already talked about dispersion yesterday and how to think about it and how it was a combination or a, or a, a kind of balance between anomalous dispersion of the ge geometrical waveguide and, uh, and the dispersion of the material. So the kind of fibers that we are using in this work mainly, in this, in this work mainly, we don't use photonic band gap fibers. We're using these, these hollow core fibers that guide by this anti-resonant reflection uh, uh, mechanism, ARR, I call it. So I couldn't think of a decent acronym for it. Um, I mean, it's been given other names. Arr, that's right. That's nice. the people from Cornwall, they say Arr. Isn't that right? I think that's right. I'm not sure. So I'm told. So an R. Uh, 
Maybe the most important thing on this slide is that, that for these fibers, they don't have a photonic band gap. They have an, they have an incomplete photonic band gap. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lowering of the density of states in this periodic cladding, which is way not surprising because because you've removed a lot of the glass, and you'd expect the density of states to be lower because there's less glass, I mean, in a very, very simple-minded way. Um, so there isn't any photonic band gap, and yet we can get, you know, we get reasonably low loss guidance, about a dB per meter. In some cases, it's quite a bit less than that, but, but it's this sort of order, but it's about a thousand times higher than the very best photonic band gap holocore fiber. So it's a substantially high loss. But for the kind of experiments I'm talking about here, this is perfectly acceptable. And it brings huge advantages with it. One of them is that these, these, these types of fibers guide very, very broad bandwidths in terms of wavelength. You, you can guide light from the ultraviolet to the infrared in some of these fibers. And in nonlinear optics, extreme nonlinear optics, where you want to generate lots of new wavelengths and do all kinds of things, um, this is a wonderful thing to have. Another feature of these fibers is that uh, they have a very high damage threshold. You can put enormously high intensities into the core. We're talking 10 to the 15 watts per centimeter squared, maybe even 10 to the 16 in some cases. So you can easily get to intensities where you can ionize the gas. This is also a very attractive thing if you're working at very high intensities. Um, and it's way, way beyond what you can do with solid glass fibers that have solid glass but how do they work, and why, is, why, does all this, why does all this work? Well, the, the key thing is the design of the first layer. So to get this anti-resonant reflection, you need to design the first layer, and this is a structure from the University of Bath. It's this paper here. Very, very nice result. Uh, where these, these, these capillaries, I mean, they're not really, they're sort of weird-shaped capillaries in this case, but the area of these hollow channels is such that when you excite the fundamental mode in the core, it's unable to have a conversation with the modes in these capillaries. When I say have a conversation, I mean it's unable to talk to them, it's unable to couple to them, because they're, they're, they're strongly phase mismatched. So this means you can keep the light in the core for quite a long time, and it, it can actually tunnel through a little bit. You know, it's a very strong reflection, but, but there's a, some possibility of it tunneling into the glass outside and leaking away. But you can get losses of well below 1 dB per meter, with this kind of design. Here is, is a more recent structure that we've been, we've been working on, a couple of our papers here, where we've been able to design it so that we can eliminate the higher order modes. It's like an endlessly single mode holocore fiber. Um, this particular case, this involves getting the ratio of D to D correct. Um, and this is the original fiber, the Kagome fiber, that many of you will have heard of. Uh, which it guides by exactly the same mechanism. Um, uh, this was made by Feta Ben Abid back in 2003. I think we published the paper on this. Um, and we didn't understand how it worked back then. Uh, but you can chuck away all this complicated stuff. Uh, it's, it's completely unnecessary. Just the first row of hollow channels that gives, that gives this um, broadband, uh, broadband guidance um, and so on. And the reason you get ultra-broadband guidance is, well, there's one way to understand this, this and this is that the, it has to do with dispersion. You've got, you've got, say, you've got the index, you've got the core mode, which maybe have an index, let's say, here, and you have the index of these capillaries, and if you change the wavelength, this is going to change in some kind of way. You'd like them to stay dephased. I mean, if they become phased, you lose, you get loss. So, so as you change the wavelength, you want those to disperse as slowly as possible as you change the wavelength, so they maintain that, that difference in refractive index. And it turns out that that's exactly what this structure gives you. You can get massive bandwidths of, of guidance. Whereas the tonic band gap fiber, the dispersion is much, much more, is much stronger when you change wavelength. So, so they have a narrower bands of guidance. Anyway, this structure is ideal for enhancing nonlinear gas light interactions. You just put gas in the structure using gas cells or whatever. Um, and you get factors of maybe 10,000 times enhancement compared to a focused Gaussian beam. But the, so this is just summarizing what I've said already. Um, but the really neat thing about this is that we have a means of pressure controlling the dispersion. So we start out with, with the hollow, empty, hollow waveguide. It has anomalous dispersion because it's, it's hollow. There's nothing in it. So you know that already. It has anomalous dispersion. 
and it has fairly small values of dispersion. Telecoms fibers have about 20 times higher dispersion compared to these values. Um, and uh, over a very broad range of wavelengths, from 400 nanometers out to 1.5, the dispersion only changes by one, one picosecond squared per kilometer. This is really weak dispersion. And that's really nice because when you, when you add gas to the core at any kind of reasonable pressure, I mean, gas is, of course, a dilute. They don't have much refractive index. You, know, you have to make them into a liquid to get high refractive index. But it turns out that this is a very sweet spot in terms of engineering that uh, we, by putting in two atmospheres, 30 atmospheres or so of, of argon gas in this case, the gas itself has normal dispersion in, in this wavelength range. So it lifts this dispersion surface upwards and creates a dispersion zero. For the empty core, the dispersion zero is at, at infinite frequency. I mean, theory, of course, it's, it's not going to be there, but, but that, that's what the theory would tell you. When you add the gas, you just counterbalance the anomalous dispersion and you can, you can create all these different dispersion curves. Uh, and what is wonderful about this in, for experiments is that for the first time we have, we have an optical fiber where just by changing, turning a knob in the lab, we can change its dispersion radically. So you can actually tune the way the system responds in non optic sense uh, just by changing the pressure. OK, I'm not going to talk about that. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to talk now about uh, simulated Raman scattering. Um, I haven't been following the time. How am I doing this now? It's about an, an hour, isn't it, since I started? Okay. So I think what I'll, I'll talk about these two topics, and then maybe we can have a little break for questions. So I hope you're writing down your questions. Yeah? No? Okay. <laughs> so I'm, what I'm going to tell you now is, is how we can make use of this, of this, this, uh, this pressure control of dispersion to do some very nice things with stimulated Raman scattering broadband Raman wavelength conversion. Um, so once again, we always come back to dispersion. It's always the first thing you think about in nonlinear optics, because there's normally some nonlinearity is normally always there, some sort of nonlinearity, but dispersion is the thing you need to control. So suppose we are operating close to a zero dispersion point. Now, when, when you're operating near to a zero dispersion point, we plot a frequency wave vector diagram. And I'm going to be thinking about uh, expanding around the zero dispersion point here. Below that zero dispersion point, we see that the group velocity of the light is faster at higher frequency, so that makes the dispersion down here anomalous. At the top, the group velocity is lower at higher frequency, so we have normal dispersion. And it switches sign at the zero dispersion point. Kind of obvious, yeah? But what is not, I mean, OK, you can see that curve and say, oh, OK, I understand it, fine. We can get solitons down here, but not up there. But there's some other, other very, very nice thing about this, and it has to do with its shape, um, the fact that it's the, called this S shape. Um, so let, let, let's suppose we, we, uh, we excite, we, we put in a strong narrowband signal at a frequency up here at this red dot. So that we choose this frequency. We pump this system strongly. The at that point, and we get stimulated Raman scattering. As, as, uh, as Roy mentioned last night, he talked a little bit about that. But uh, what you find is that you get what we call a Stokes signal generated at a lower frequency. Okay, so you, you, you lose the photons lose some energy to phonons, to, op to optical phonons actually, or to molecular motion in a gas, and uh, you create some new photons at a different frequency. And in order to do that, what you have to do is change the frequency of these photons by a certain amount, which equals the Raman frequency. So the frequency drops by the Raman frequency. Uh, but you also have to change the, <coughs> the momentum, momentum of the light by this delta beta. So in order to get to that point, we have to change the momentum of the photons by this amount. And this, this, the, 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 the vibration of the molecules in time gives us this frequency difference and the Spatial coherence, the, 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 the relative phases of the molecules, give you this delta beta. So this is a spatial thing. It's actually a, a moving fringe pattern. I'm going to show you this in a moment. So we, have a, we kind of have a spatial frequency and we have a, a temporal frequency. And you need these two, these two things to be exactly right in order to get this to work. And in the process of this, once you've got stimulated drama scattering going, we have created a coherence wave of molecular motion, which has frequency omega r and uh, wave vector delta, delta beta. 
And this is how it, how it looks, and just a little cartoon to give you a, an impression of this. If, if I imagine I take this signal, the optical signal, and this optical signal, and I superimpose them, they have different frequencies, they have different wave vectors, they will produce a, f a fringe pattern, but of course, since there are different frequencies, that fringe pattern will move. So this is the fringe pattern of the light, okay, with a wavelength given by 2 pi over delta beta. That's the coherence length, is this, this, this pitch. And this fringe pattern is able to drive the molecular motion, so it, it, it forces the molecules to vibrate in, in a kind of, uh, not in phase, but to vibrate in such a way as that their, their relative phases are such as to create, to create a traveling a traveling coherence wave. You can see the, the wave is traveling along if I follow the, the motion of the molecules. And this, this translates itself into a, a moving refractive index wave. So the refract, you get a, a modulation in refractive index, which is traveling. The molecules themselves stay where they are. And uh, I have a, a wonderful Spanish postdoc called David Navoa, who has some Spanish friends whose who's, uh, interest in life is... is um, is going around, is exploring the web and trying to find out the most, the strangest things that people actually do. You know? uh, he's some kind of social, he's interested in the way people behave. And he discovered this, uh, he discovered this. <laughs> I think he was having a conversation with David. And he said, oh, I know something that might, might, might help you here. This, this is the Thai, this, this is the army of, of Thailand. These are Thai soldiers doing this incredible display. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're oscillating. So this is the individual molecules oscillating. And they're creating, <laughs> creating a coherence wave. And what stuns me is how precise they are. It's just extraordinary. Just amazing. So that, that's a human coherence wave. <laughs> and this is a molecular coherence wave. So now you're never going to forget the concept of a coherence wave, I think. <laughs> OK, so what's the point of this? Well, the point of this is that this process, through this process, we create this coherence wave. And it, if we turn the light off, it will survive for a certain length of time, which is called the coherence time, for obvious reasons. The coherence wave will live for a certain length of time. And within that time, you can then make use of this thing that you've written into the gas. You've written this pattern into the gas. It's like a hologram. It's like a nonlinear hologram of some sort. You can then read it out. So I could say uh, the beauty of this sh S shape is that I can take the frequency wave vector combination that gave me this coherence wave, and I can transpose it down to here, a completely different part of the optical spectrum. And uh, if I put light in here at this frequency, put a signal in here, it could be a weak signal, it could be a strong signal, it doesn't really matter, I will be able to, to the, the, this light will interact with the coherence wave, will we'll, we'll steal its energy. So so, so it, what, what it does is able to take the, into the energy from the individual molecules, extract it from the system, and increase the, the photon energy. So, so we, can, we can actually recover the, the energy from the molecular motion. And this, of course, another way of looking at this, that is, this is, is that the entropy of the system has not changed, that the, the entropy of, of this, this molecular motion is very small. And if it, provided you didn't wait too long, it will stay small. But if you wait too long, it loses its coherence and the entropy goes up. It becomes random. And then you can't extract the energy anymore. Okay, but, but so within the coherence time, we can extract the energy and use it to, to upshift uh, a signal in, in frequency in this band. Or you could do it the other way around. We could write it here and we could read it out up here. So it's a kind of nonlinear horography. It's got, it's got uh, the, the Doppler shift in it. It's got the Raman scattering. It's got all kinds of things. It's, it's, it's got so much physics in it. Um, depending on how you look at it. Now, just to show you that it, that it works, um, here are the results of experiments. Let me explain this. Let's see. Uh, over here is a plot of where the dis zero dispersion wavelength sits. The wavelength of the zero dispersion wavelength as a function of pressure. Again, wonderful system, this. We can, we can radically change the position of the zero dispersion wavelength. And what we're doing is we're pumping with a doubled YAG laser at 532 nanometers. This is the pump wavelength. We're creating a Stokes wave down here at whatever the Stokes frequency is. For, this is hydrogen, so it's 125 terahertz different. Um, <clears throat> so if we take, for example, and this is hydrogen, so we're working with three atmospheres of hydrogen in a core of about 40 micron diameter. 
we're writing with this, we're, we're, we're producing a Stokes wave here, so this is the coherence wave we're producing. It's a slightly complicated plot, but this is basically is wave vector and frequency. 